is but this question addressed to me. Is it to the fish? What would be the answer if you were a fish? Yeah, yeah. People, of course, people, that would be another answer. So so that was the first thing that came to my mind and I thought we should we should start from there. So people in general will say, of course we should eat fish, I would say that because I eat fish. And I doubt if the fish will say that. <laughs> now, the next question that came to my mind is if, if it is people this is addressed to which I think is the goal here, who are we in this question? You know, I, I see a lot of we's and I use them about myself, but who are we? Well, there's a basket, right? And then it summarizes a lot of things. And so you start thinking, are you thinking of current or future generations? I can see a situation where somebody who is going to be born here in Seattle and 100 years time saying, don't touch the fish until I come up, right? Keep the fish, keep them, store them for me, so when I come there will be lots of them and I'll have fun, right? And the current generation will say, come on, I need my fish for dinner now, right? So if you, you can just go through a number of things and the answers will vary quite dramatically. Are you a Spanish person sitting in a city in Spain? at your dinner on the plate, or are you the Senegalese fish, whose only source of fish protein is that fish, right? What will you say? How about if you're a subsistence fisher, who's just tied the fish, you can send it home and eat, and sell a bit to pay little school fees or buy a test book for your kid, versus the big commercial fisher with the boat that can take thousands of kilograms or tons of fish, right? different answers. So if I'm a market person, I want everybody to eat fish. Demand and supply, prices will go up, I'll be rich, my bank account will be great, right? But if you're a subsistence fish, I said, maybe I shouldn't think too much, because tomorrow will come and I need that fish to feed my family. Are you a government? Are you a government or an individual? So there are various ways you can look at it. So it's, it's quite a big question and a difficult one, and uh, I'll try to look at it a little bit better in, uh, in the narrow sense. Then one thing I did was to quickly Google, you know, you can't get away from these days. I just put, should we eat fish and, and saw so what came up? And these are some of the things that came up. What fish should we eat? What fish should we eat? All fish is not fish, right? I'm talking about that little catenta in the, in the little river in Africa. Or are you talking about uh, pork in Alaska? So, so what fish should we eat? Should we stop eating fish? Some people actually said, should we stop eating fish? Uh, why should we eat fish? Why do we want to eat fish? So all sorts of interesting questions from different angles. And this could be a philosopher asking, why should we eat fish? We want to eat. And you can go down. And the last one is, can we eat our fish and protect them? This was actually an article in, uh, in Forbes magazine, huh? so, so business magazine. So can we eat them? They're, they're a bit clever. Can we eat them and still protect them? And, and so you, you go into it. All this can lead to all sorts of things. So I'm just throwing them out here. Thank you. Then there are 10 talks in this series. And if I, if I was sitting in my office when I when I, design, when I when I kind of develop my title, I would have actually done something close to what Paul Demo will talk about. It's going to come here in two weeks' time, Danish, well respected uh, fisheries, suspected scholar. And he says, no oh, seafood for the future without good governance. Experiences from you. So it's, it's a more dynamic question. Right? It's all stinky. No fish if you don't govern them well. That sounds closer to what I would say. And I would have said, can we continue eating fish in the face of our economic management and overfishing? Or in the face of climate change and ocean acidification? So my talk is going to go around these two questions. Can we continue eating fish? Or we continue doing bad economics? And also, for all the changes coming, the nutrients, what I call the nutrients. And that's not all that the problems the oceans face. You know about all sorts of stories here, oil spill there, plastic, and all sorts of things. 
So my talk, of course, is just going to be this small piece of So just to. So now let's get going. Can we continue eating fish in the face of bad economic management and overfishing? So this is a model everybody here would have seen. It's the walk workhorse. These are the kind of models I have actually. Simple models. Models that you can criticize like crazy. Criticize them to have. At least they keep going. <laughs> and they're beautiful. I mean, uh, I think they won't be smiling, right? Because they don't say they, 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 they don't say everything. But they say enough for you to get something. So so I'm going to pull out on this uh, So what I call bad economic management of fishes is essentially for economists, if you are not maximizing the rent, the benefit, then you are not managing the fishery well. And most fisheries economists will say that this is a big debate about that. People come to me and say, what the hell are you talking about? We need more fish because people are hungry. I gave a big talk in Bombas uh, where I put up this and the people went after me and I said, why do you we need more fish? I said, sure, you need more fish. But the last time I checked, actually, I don't think you're starving because there's not enough food in the world. I think we're starving in Africa because we don't have money to buy food. There's lots of food, right? Is there no one who can argue against that in this room? Lots of food. People throw away food. The farmers can't sell, right? So, so maybe that is not as crazy as right? trying to maximize the, the benefit you get. So anything that is over the first E1 there, I would consider bad money. Point of view, but I know that biologists will say we should take the maximum sustainable yield. In fact, the whole world is run. If you go to the UN, the targets are all the MSY. So that is fine. And actually, there are many social scientists who argue that we should be here. Who we'll come to me and say, What is this nonsense you're saying here? So you make all this money, and who, who gets it? And I think there's some. some <coughs> So if it's a corrupt fisheries management system, they, they take care of all the benefit that people don't get. So you should better allow people to employ them, right? And then the more people you sacrifice the right So one can argue in different ways here, but, but for this talk I'm going to stick with the economic <coughs> of what's bad. Simple model, another simple model. Everybody here probably knows this. So here you have the, the benefit, that's your rent. It's a simple model that's the price, constant price per kilo or ton. And these are total harvest. That's your cost of your, your cost of taking the boat to fish, for example. So that's the unit cost of effort and that's an effort. Simple shaper harvest model. This is you can criticize this to death because it doesn't do a lot, right? You know that. But in theory it, it, it helps you. So you have your rent simply that. And in open access, your rent is zero, right? I think most people are selling this. <coughs> so if you can make money from the fishery, people will keep fishing harder, more people will come in until you cannot make money. And that will be. And if you just take this simple model, and what it is, this thing here tells you that the amount of fish you have in the ocean depends what? Only, only on your unit cost of fishing. The price you get for your fish and the technology, the capability for fishing. This is a very powerful resource. You don't need anything more. And I always use a framework that we know, right? We're here at the IFS. I say, if you want to know about your fishery, don't go to the stock assessment person. You go to the economies, follow the money, right? So essentially, I'm joking, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but this model that is essentially what I say. You need to know the cost of fishing, the price of the fish, and the technology. And that can tell you what stock is in there, even if you don't go down diving and counting fish. And it just tells you that there's a lot that we can gain from economic data and economic analysis, and of course the analysis of the technology you use to guide the fish. Now, having said that, then the big question here is, how far are we from open access? If you take any fishery or a global fishery together, how far are you away from open access? If you are at the maximum economic yield, that is great, that means you are doing well. 
And if you are the, at the MSY, you are doing well biologically. So that's good. But are you close to open access if you consider the world's fisheries together or not? If you are not close, then we are doing fine, no bad economic management. And I'm going to use data here to try to show that actually we are quite close to open access globally. And this is a, a little gold mine I, 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 I thought. This is a private company, financial company actually, putting together uh, commercial fishing data in the global fishing industry. And they collect data for about a thousand top companies, fishing companies in the world. And uh, financial data, and they do this actually to provide financial information for investors who want to invest in the sector. So in a way, it, you can rely, you can feel that it's reliable data because they do need to get investors. It's not me sitting in my office in Baku looking up numbers, right? So, so I tend to feel this is uh, a bit more reliable. Uh, and, and this is uh, some of the summary. So a thousand top global fishing companies operating in 43 <coughs> countries, most of them big fishing nations, actually. And the data set, as I got them, uh, was for three years. This is uh, very expensive. I paid about a thousand euros for the book for the information because they are busy. Total annual sales value of all companies is about 21 billion dollars. 21 billion, which is about 25% of our global number that we our estimate of global landed value, so about 80, 85 billion, 90, depending on the year of the dollar. So in a way, of the top thousand and twenty-five percent of the total. And this is the kind of data they have. They have various types of data, financial data. But my focus is on the profitability, the pre-tax profit of this company, because that hopefully will tell me something about how close they are, either as individual companies or as countries, or the world, how close we have to open access. So this is some of the things we found out. Of the 1,000 companies, 339 reported losses, negative profits. 340, 340 of them. Are negative for the three years that, that is reported. And 31 of the 43 countries have at least one company within the country reporting negative profits. So it's, it's quite widespread, only 12 countries within our okay? And 16 of the 43 countries in the report had negative weighted when you weight the profits by the landed value. Uh, 16 of them actually had. Uh, uh, negative weighted average profits, if you, if you look at it. You see there's lots of negative information here. So, and if you look at the countries, if you do the weighted average, these are the countries that are making money according to this report, the companies within these countries. And it might just be like Cayman Islands, somebody trying to trying to hide away profits by the <laughs> donate, donate. Not a former presidential candidate, no, but yeah. So, <laughs> so you have these things happening. These are the countries doing well. New Zealand and Norway are there, we know those countries. South Africa is doing well, trouble. Yeah, isn't that cool? Japan and so on. So these are the top 10. Then you come to the bottom, bottom 10. And this is what you have. Argentina, Australia. This shocks everybody because it has a good reputation as a a good money in that system, so there's something out there with the confidence there. But that's it, that's, that's what you see. All right, just to give you an idea at the country level. Now, the first two bullet points pre tax profit as percentage of the sales value range from all negative 0.37%. So I'm, I'm taking the total profit the com companies in the country make and dividing by their sales value. Landed value essentially. You have Greece at the bottom, very close to zero. The US at the top, very close to zero, but on the positive side. And if you take the average pre tax profit for all the thousand companies, you get 0.012% positive. Isn't that like zero to you? Right? <laughs> it's like zero. So open access, right? And therefore, I can say almost very confidently. Fish stocks are not doing well based on the simple shape of money. And combining that with economic data. Now, 
I call this extreme bad management, economic management. And that is subsidies. Many of you have seen things have written and what I've said. So you have extreme bad economic management subsidies. And again, if you use the Schaeffer model, you remember this was the point where we talked about open access. But with subsidies, if it is on your total cost of fishing, this is what you get. You just drop down, right? You drop down, and you have more effort. So if you have subsidies, you aggravate the thing. The market would have stopped them here without subsidies, then you get another simple model which says a lot. And here, the dollars, total revenue, and total cost, <coughs> fishing effort. That's the total revenue pay, and that's the first total cost of fishing in the second. So subsidies aggravate the problem by encouraging more, more subsidies, more, more effort. Not all subsidies, as I would just say, but some of them. So this is our estimate of total subsidies in the world. That's the latest estimate we have. And we categorize subsidies into three main groups. Uh, what my, my graduate student then he came up with, uh, with, uh, with a name for this. He said the good, the bad, and the ugly, actually. Yeah. So the good, are, the good are the beneficial subsidies. So this is like fisheries management, control and monitoring, trying to block feeding and fishing and the like. We spend about $8 billion a year. Capacity enhancing, the bad ones, fuel subsidies and the like, $16 million. And these are subsidies we put in place easily here. It depends on how you design your system. Like buyback schemes, right? You can design them to reduce capacity without my work. But most of the time, your, your capacity seems back scheme. Or if they are strategic and they know you are going to buy back boats, and now I'm a fisher, I will keep two boats instead of one, like in anticipation. So there's strategic thinking that can lead to, to So you need to design that very well. That's and that is 27 billion in total. Remember, I said the landed value is about what, 88 5 billion. So we are talking about at least 30 percent of the landed value is government money being put. I did a little one page of an Indian magazine about subsidies. And you know the title I gave the paper? A fish called subsidies. So the ten of your fish is subsidies, and and that just aggravates. Them. So this is just to give you more information from the paper. Japan is quite <coughs> as a country. Europe doesn't appear here because uh, I, I didn't put them together as a European Union. But you have China. But if you look at Japan, you see all of these are actually <coughs> subsidies. So the US is similarly so. Am I, oh, sorry. Japan is capacity enhancing. is the US actually that has a lot of what we describe as beneficial. I think it's because of the of the eight management councils and all the resources that go into that. So that's what it is. Yeah. The subsidies are there, they are big, and uh, it costing people to fish more than they would without them. And then compounded bad management, that's illegal fishing, IU fishing, illegal unreported and uh, unregulated fishing. It's a big thing. Some years back, we, we collected data about all the reported apprehensions, you know, if you are caught fishing illegally and put it in this uh, and got it published somewhere. And you see, you see, it's happening everywhere. Is that true? Is that a true statement? At one talk, I said it's happening everywhere, and I was a bit unlikely. There was a lady from New Zealand in the audience. <laughs> the door, she we don't do it. <laughs> Sorry, I won't say that again, but maybe it's because we never got the data. <laughs> so, this is just how important it is. And you, you know about this place, right? What comes to your mind? Somalia, right? Somalia, close to my name, but they are not the same. <laughs> yeah, so, so there is a lot of activity there, and the piracy you hear about actually are linked to illegal fishing in the beginning. So these things can have big impacts, not just in fisheries, but uh, out over there. And if you ask economists why there's a lot of illegal fishing, it's essentially because uh, it pays to do it. Uh, yeah, uh, Gary Baker did it, started his papers of 
social and institutional economics, and uh, he created the model. I mean, I still rely on uh, the economics of crime and punishment. And simply, what well, that paper says is a very simple test. If it pays to do it, most people will do it. Not everybody. John. John did uh, a little survey in the East <coughs> where they tried to find out if you have a population of fishes, how many of them will cheat if they could or if the economics was good. And they found something which I found very interesting. What they found is that at the tails, you have 10% of the population who will never cheat. Morally wrong, we won't do it. 10%. And at the other extreme, 10% roughly, who will cheat even if you have chains on their legs? <laughs> they just do it to one another. And then 80% of the population are those who obey this rule, essentially. They're like, okay, is it worth it? So, and I think it, it, it plays out in many, many populations. So essentially, we are allowing uh, this to happen because there's no monitoring. The chances of being caught is very low. And even if you are caught, what do they do to you? In South Africa, they got so frustrated because the, the legal system doesn't know how to deal with somebody stealing <coughs> or catching them, they should. So you do all the effort, you arrest somebody, you take them to court, and then the, the judges will say, what has the man done? He just went fishing. They were so frustrated they created a special criminal uh, law for the environment for a few years just to make the court system realize that it's serious. So that's one of them. And all these things coming together, leading bad economics, leading to more and more inflation. This is data, this is catch data uh, from the FAO and the CRRs. So that's the projection. So, so what are you seeing here? Big rises in the beginning. Uh, in the 50s. For fisheries analysis, the beginning is actually about this year. And this is because that was the year the global community gave the FO, the Food and Agricultural Organization of the UN, the mandate to collect this data. So that's, that is why most of our analysis starts there. And that's the part that you start seeing something here. And when I put this thing up and I say, see, now we, we are not going like before, some actually say, oh, it's because Maybe it's because we're a bit lazy. We don't want to go fishing. So the fish are there in the ocean. It's just that we don't fish hard like before. So we created this thing. That's, that's when we started stabilizing. And this is an estimate of the fishing effort. Right? The recent paper, maybe we have colleagues projected. So the fishing effort, effective fishing effort. Your catch is stabilizing. And the effort is growing. You don't need to say much, right? Working harder for less because of what clearly some of fishing is happening. All right, so that's the first part of the of the talk. Bad economics, subsidies, are you fishing aided and helping us to continue our overfishing? Now let's move to what I call the new trust. Can we continue eating fish in the face of climate change and ocean acidification? This is what my climate scientists have been saying. The world. Sea surface temperature is rising. This is about the, the average of some period. So the more the more reddish you are, the, the higher you are over the long term average temperature. So there are lots of places that I get the ocean is getting warmer. An increase in ocean temperature of that. According to the research, sea ice. Less of it is happening. More acidic, right? Some parts of the ocean are the pH is changing. And less oxygenated areas in the ocean. So all these things we are told by the scientists are happening. And I tend to believe them, right? One of the scientists. So, so then if these things are happening, these are some of the things that are likely to happen in the ocean, right? Since the first temperature can affect individual fish populations of fish living communities and the whole ecosystem and you have all the nutrients happening and they are likely impacts on all these things according to the literature and what will happen. So scientists are telling me this as some economists what what will this lead to? And 
these are some papers that have actually gone a bit deeper, looking at species. Salmon, so high. Chances that this will be affected by climate change in that paper. Uh, well, pink salmon, another uh, one. Cod is being named. People have said that the reason we lost or we almost lost it. The Nunifagalan cod is a combination of fishing and climate. And then you have that happening in George's Bank. And that's the fishing and mallocks and, and all those types. A couple of the, 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 the species of the hard, hard, hard forest. So this is just to kind of bring me down to earth a bit and look at the literature and see what people are saying to specific, about specific species. So I take all this information from the science and the biology, the climate people. And then I say that if these things are going to happen, then they will have economic consequences. The catches will be affected. They may increase in some places. So you might have more fish to eat, right? Or they may increase. And that has directly to <coughs> food security. The money you make, the cost of fishing may change, right? The fish are moving closer to shore uh, because of climate change, right? You catch them cheaply, so that helps you. If they are moving further away, you have to do some more work to find the same fish. So your cost of fish will change, and therefore the profits to companies will change. Incomes to fishes affected, and the distribution of benefits between countries, regions, that was what I meant by who are we. If a fish is going to come to you like the Icelandic are waiting and hoping and, 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 and for, right? Then, then there's more fish to eat. I'm, I'm, not, I'm forgetting trade for just a moment. But, and if, if you are, foreign fish will be moving away, then you have to take it twice. So, the loss of possible economic uh, consequences of this. Now, just to kind of concretize again, imagine you have fish in this area, right, of the ocean. You have some fish in the area of the distribution, you have your depth here, and your latitude. So, up here by the coast, and you have deeper in the ocean. So you have fish in there. And then you have all these effects, the nutrients have warm, high oxygen, <coughs> habitat change. And you might have a shift in the distribution. That's what every, every scientist is saying that I know. That one of the first effects will be the redistribution of fish. And the fish will move, right? Unlike us, we can put the heater on or the air conditioner. What would fish do if it's getting too hot? They move in, they come. So there will be sheets around. And so suddenly, the fish has gone from that sector to a new place, higher in, in latitude and, and, and depth changes. And another fish may actually come in, right? And it, so there will be invasions and local extinctions, and changes in mortality, growth, and body sizes. And imagine that these are two countries that are sitting there. What is likely to happen here? Huh? Lots of implications. Some will have more fish to eat, some will not. Or some can sell more fish, make money, and so on and so forth. So, and this can lead to lots of things, management issues, and, and so on and so forth. And this is not just, uh, so this is a model by William Chan, uh, place, and putting the whole global ocean and, and modeling it. This is the kind of thing he writes. So there will be increases in fish biomass at the poles. And, oh. and then here in the tropics, the bang is likely to be there more. So the fish will be moving right away from, from, from that place. And this is not just modeling work. I have, a, I have an example here. You've all heard about the McMill story, the UK rice man. Yeah, so this is happening. Uh, last year, there was a big economist uh, conference in Singapore, uh, the World Ocean Economics Conference or something like that. And I was there, and the president of Iceland, and Charles Clover, Charles Clover, at the end of the line, he was there. Right? So the Icelandic prime minister, they call him more prime minister, gave a talk, and he got a question from Charles. Charles says, Tell me now, are you going to tell this crowd that Iceland, you stop doing what you're doing, right? 
this mackerel is not your fish, and you are catching double your quota just because you can catch it. So are you going to tell this crowd, are you going to pull back? And the Icelandic Prime Minister just smiled back in a very funny way. Yeah, I think I will not tell this crowd that. What I will tell you, the British people is that you have to be realistic. This fish is no more yours, it's ours, he said. So you're going to have a lot of fish moving there, and the consequences can be. They were talking about material war. And who will eat the fish? This is an African story, food security. If you have been to West Africa, Senegal, for example, Ghana and all that, fish is really important for the South community. Probably the only protein they, they, they have, the animal protein. You know. So it's very important. And as you saw, the tropics will be the one to get the heat, the, the, to, to take the, the, the thing in, in their chain. And that, uh, you know, naturally bothers a lot of people because this is the part of the world that needs the protein more than we here. Don't you think so? And the fish is moving to Iceland. Yeah. So, so, yeah, this we're trying to do modeling uh, of this, and this is what we're seeing. These parts of the world are going to lose their fish and more up here. And, uh, see. So, and what, what does it mean in terms of food security? I just put this thing here, just for fun. Uh, this one, this is something I got from the Washington Post. Look at it carefully. They're trying to show this is men body mass index and women here. And then you have these boxes, this uh, normal one, normal weight. If you are normal weight, you fall in here. If you are my head weight, you see here. For these, here. And these are continents of the world. So if you look here, the, the, if you have the Africans and Asians, Latin Americans in here, and you have us somewhere there, right? And the fish is coming to us again, right? So I think this, to me, this is a, a moral dilemma that we, we need to be dealing with. If you think of the CO2 pumping, it's not just people sitting in the tropics that are pumping it. It's we again, and they get the pay. So that's a little one I just want to drop here. When you say, shall we eat fish? Maybe those who really need the fish to eat will not get it because of all this happening. And they don't have the cash to buy from China, for example, agriculture. Fish, as most people think, we will be saved by agriculture. Even if we have to have a foreign currency to buy fish. 70% of agriculture in the world is China. Right? Do you know that? 70%. So, Aqua is going to say, Guinea Bissau, I don't think so. And if you take Asia, that's almost close to 90%. So, the rest of the world. So, something to think about, right, in terms of Aqua. I don't have a culture here that I thought I should mention. Now, and we did some modeling to look at, um, I'm saying that these problems are not just international even within countries. And we did some modeling work for, for Mexico. We did two scenarios. We took the IPCC scenarios, a mild scenario, and uh, a mild climate change scenario, and a severe one. And we did our modeling of the biology and the economics. And this is the kind of thing we are seeing. There's no time to give you the details of this will appear soon. And what I'm showing you here, the red places are the places that will lose value, catch value. Catch and land and back. And the blue areas are those that will gain. The yellow ones are almost about the same, no change. So under the mile, you don't have uh, there's a red, there's a blues, there's a lot here. So the question for you, even if you are all Mexicans, are the fishing communities fishing here today? Are they going to be allowed to just move here and fish? What are the logistics? So even within a country, these are big issues. You know. We're not talking about Canada with the three oceans. If you look at climate effects, the impacts on the Pacific, the Arctic, and the Atlantic are very big. The Arctic may actually see more fish. The Atlantic will see less and so on. So these are management implications, and, and, and they also have implications on what we should fish. Now, Fish will be going to Iceland and Norway, but new research just published by William and the guy here 
and just looking at oxygen, the effects of oxygen in the ocean, right? The decrease in oxygen. And this is the kind of thing they're seeing. The size of fish we're talking about is changing what body weight of population. And the whole idea here is that if there's less oxygen for the fish to take, right, it's going to affect. I cannot explain the science of this as they would. But essentially, lack of oxygen means they have to trade off something. And one of the things they trade off is their body mass to survive. So that will be showing fish. So even if you are Iceland or Norway and you're happy you're going to be able to eat more fish, that is one impact to think about. Right? It's not a good. And they estimated the impact to 40% shrinking in the size of a given type of fish. Just look to you know the oxygen effects. That's one thing to know. And then there's ocean acidification. Vicky Lam is my, my PhD student and she's looking at this so this is information just for you, right? It's not yet out there. But this, we're doing a lot of uh, modeling and simulation analysis trying to find impacts, economic and social impacts of ocean acidification in the Arctic, in the Arctic, right? Because the, the feeling is that, or the understanding is that the, the changes in the Arctic are going to be above average from most, of, most places because of the special nature of the Arctic. So here you are, this is a funny one. As you see in the numbers, if you just look at climate change, actually there would be again an economic impact. So that is the current and this is our estimate. So there will be more fish moving and, and they can make money if that is the only effect. But if you take in ocean acidification, you drop down. Right? So I see this as the fish riding away from hot water, right, riding away, and then they go into acid. Right? <laughs> Can you imagine that? That's too gloomy. I hope I'm not like This is the <laughs> So get away from temperature, get into acid. How many of us would want to do that? <laughs> but okay. It may be big things adapt, right? Adaptation may help us uh, if only we can beat the speed of these changes. Uh, just rolling. So you have to think of the impact on the growth and the size of the fish and also things like ocean acidification. So, come to my conclusion. So we'll have time for questions. So, no fish to eat in the future with bad economic management of fisheries, continued overfishing, and increasing climate change and ocean acidification. And to increase the chances of continuing to eat fish into the future, many of us will have to stop fishing has anybody told you to stop fishing? Am I the first one in this series? Many of us will have to stop eating fish, or at least reduce our intake significantly. And I'm told I say many of us, those of us who it's not a life and death thing, there are alternatives. You know, the alternatives may be costly. I know there are trade-offs. Ray is not here, right? It's better to eat fish than to eat beef, right? I know the story, but you can also be a bit a bit less, right? So I did a paper a few years ago and, uh, and presented at the Triple A. So the title was, Whose Fish Are You Eating? You saw your grandchildren. And actually, since that paper, I've cut my intake by 50%. That's what I mean. I remember, is it mine or my granddaughter? You know, that kind of thing. So that's what I'm alluding to here. Those of us who can afford, you can't say this to somebody in West Africa who's born and born. <coughs> it's the fish. So, should we eat fish? Yes, we should. Some of us should eat a bit less if we can. Some of us who can stop can stop to help the system, given all that is happening to us. Thanks a lot for your attention.
uh, skewed towards developing countries, and do you think that it's more of an economics problem, or is it going to take a solution of like sociocultural engineering? Yeah, I would say it's a combination. I mean, there is the economic problem, and that is that we are not managing the fisheries. We, essentially, we, we're just allowing too many people to fish because they don't have alternatives. It's all the reasons, right? But that keeps the system down. There's no two way about it. So there is the economic part, but the larger problem is what you said. Uh, we need those bigger level stuff. So after you've made the cake there, how do you share it? And that can so there's both of them. Uh, and in terms of this equity and, and people using fish as the kind of employer of last resort, this is something I always fight with when I go to Africa or uh, in Asia, right? Uh, they tell me, oh, what, are you do? what do we do with our poor fish? And if you take all the fish and feed them today, what will you do with them tomorrow, right? Tomorrow we'll take care of this. this but, but essentially, you just have to find a way to get out of this vicious cycle, and I don't have a solution to that, but at least you expose it and let people think about what to do. Yes, yeah, I was, uh, as you predicted, really surprised by the Australia result in the first part uh, of your talk, uh, primarily because they use maximum economic yield as their management target. What do you think is the disconnect between what they think as their target and what you revealed in yeah, that's a, that's a good one. You see, because this is profit for companies who operate in registered industry. So who knows, they might be fishing in other places. So that might be a bit. It's like Cape and others coming out so well. And um, another question about the beginning. I, I was really struck by the very low overall um, profit margin. I was wondering if you know if the people who are actually farming fish are doing any better than that? Or maybe a, the bigger question is, how does that profit margin compare to other economic sectors? Is it really as bad, or is it 0 0.012? To yeah. I haven't looked at agriculture, so I wouldn't be able to give you a specific answer there. Now, in terms of other industries, some do better, some do better. You know, fish is, is quite because of the common property nature. Uh, the tendency is always to get to that bad equilibrium because if there's money more for now, forget about the management, we still find a way to, to sneak in effort and so on. So that makes fisheries special. It's very prone to this thing. We say that this is a very undesirable outcome, but that is the one we all tend to. It's almost like a prisoner's dilemma.
doesn't have to be a large corporation. Why would you say that? Is it well that uh, doesn't have to pay off to how many people you employ versus how many are perpetuated? So, but you can have small units within that limit, right? You know, you can do it in some countries, try to do that by putting all sorts of limitations on how large. So I don't think it's automatically that they have to be large commercial design segments. The, the thing about employment, and I, I keep going back to it, because I think it's holding a lot of developing countries down in terms of building up and improving the, 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 the lives of the fishes. A, a few years ago, I was in Malawi, yeah? Malawi, and Atlanta, so we went out, three of us went out to a restaurant. We stayed there for at least two hours, I don't remember exactly. And there were six waitresses taking care of six of them. And the whole evening, up to the time we entered and left, it was only the three of us who were across the fishery. So, so by the end of the day, I was thinking of fisheries and thinking of this, this people. And by the time we left, I said, if this is the average, right, because it might just be a bad night. But if this is what happens, one or two people coming in three and, and keeping this people, then you can understand why they are poor, isn't it? Because that's the whole income. And I think it's related to fisheries also. You want to keep all these people in the fishery, which is nice socially, but they just what is the commonest thing you hear about fishing for this? Oh yes, okay. It's always what they tell me. So we have to find our why, right? And start to do something. This is something dear to my heart. I was saying so that it's more vicious. I want to change So, so I have a question. So, um, so one of the solutions, one of your papers, you, you talk about cat shares as being a possible solution to increase the profits of the fishery. So um, I, I can imagine a situation where, say, you keep the, the fish biomass at the right <coughs> level, you employ cat shares, and so you have the right number of people fishing. But then what happens to your profit? Well, what actually happens is you spend all your money buying quota because the quota becomes very valuable. And so you end up with exactly the same profits you would have doing something else, but you have a massive capital investment in quota. Mm. So in that case, I would like to see a fishing company with a big capital amount of money in quota making no more profits than they would in any other fish. So, so number one, which of my papers did I say we should do catch this? I saw it there somewhere. I saw it there somewhere. <laughs> so because, because if you ask Chris, actually, I'm probably one of the one of the one of the economists who will say catchers have their value, but they are not the whole at the most poor I say they're good for the economics, but socially and even ecologically there's no guarantee. It might be right. I don't know. But many economists will tell you that is the solution. And I'm not, I don't say that actually. So, okay. yeah, it can help if you design it. But I always have the design thing. If I had a paper printed and where I propose a way to make them work for, for socially and ecologically also, the things you need to package together. So, so that, that is one thing. The other thing you had in your question is about quota price and so yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's a tough one. You see, where, where does those quota values, where do they go? They go to some people. So there's a, that's a distributional thing here that you're talking about. But in general, for the economy, if the quota values are high and people are, some people are willing to pay for it, it's almost like in the market. You see what I'm trying to say? I get the social side of it. In, in BC, we make a joke. We say, uh, Jim Patterson owns the whole fish. You know, Jim Pants is the richest guy in Vancouver. And, and that's the kind of thing people are worried about, to fight about. So, the real problem. But the quota prices themselves, in themselves, right? It's like half prices. So, hmm. no easy solution. <clears throat> So, sort of, I, I had a similar reaction to, 
Tim this evening, I'm sure like that. When you had New Zealand, New Zealand made money, but not very much given the scale of New Zealand's fishery. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't see where Iceland fell up. So that's something I'll, I'll read on. 
You know what? I, well, my advice to African countries is when you enter agreements, you make sure they are mutually beneficial. Make sure you, you, you they, they pay for the value they take. So that's the kind of advice I say. You don't want to come up with something. I know trade can be useful if you do it properly. And that is what is. So I don't say ban or make sure. Don't give them. The way the agreements are done, actually, some of them, in the European Union, will just pay a given amount and then they have access to the waters. It's like Walmart just giving you pay $20 and go and go And that is the kind of thing I'm really working against. I've even uh, recommended putting together an Oceans Institute in Africa. And there's a lot of uh, enthusiasm for it. So we understand the fish stocks, we understand the value, so that when countries do these things, they don't do it in the Maybe time for one more question. I was just curious, where are you from and how did you get into this field? That's a good question. You know, uh, my, my dad is Nigerian, so I'm Nigerian. It's crazy. So I always say I'm West African because my mom is from West Africa. And I don't want to leave my, my mom behind. So that's important. And I did my PhD in Norway. I went there without any no knowledge of fish at all. But in Norway, you can get away without fish, right? So, so that is where I, I started. And I started when I was about to write my thesis. My professor at Rome had a project. I always said I wanted to do a good thesis and a good degree. I didn't care much about where I was going. Which area? Most of my friends wanted to do financial economics, but I said, I'm hoping to do a good idea. So he had a fictitious point, and he said, if you're willing, we just come. And I've never turned back. In fact, there was a competition for me. Nosh Hydro, the Norwegian oil company, they were then beginning prospecting. And they actually offered to support me to do my thesis in oil, and economics of oil. And I chose fish, and my friends told me I was a stupid person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the reason I did that, they actually said, when you finish, we'll send you to Nigeria, you will be our man in Lagos. I'm not going to be a person's man. So that scared the hell out of me, and I went fishing. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for seeing